Hi everyone, it's Liz Quain with Trailblazing Families. I'm really glad today to have um, another world's going mom friend of mine that I've met in real life. <laughs> Jennifer and I have met, I think we met in Canada first and Penticton at the Family Adventure Summit yep. and then San Miguel de Allende in Mexico, right? I think those were the two times, yep. right? Yeah, so I think so. I think, uh, and then we've had Zoom meetings together, so we've known each other over the years, and we have so many mutual friends together. So I'm really glad to have you here because, um, you know, I have my new group, my new Facebook channel, um, or my YouTube channel, and um, I want inter to interview amazing World Schooling families um, to help, like, the newbies, the people who are thinking about getting into this lifestyle, um, help them figure out how to do it. So who else? who is better about talking about um, homeschooling and world schooling together than Jennifer Miller. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> well, Liz, I hope I live up to that introduction. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sure you will. And so give everyone a little bit of a background. Um, you're Canadian and I think your husband's American, correct? Yes, actually I'm a dual citizen. So I'm, I'm American and Canadian, but we're born and raised in Canada. We, our home base is in Canada. Okay, great. And um, you started traveling how many years ago? I mean, quite a while ago. I mean, well, I mean, if you, you were a little school schooler, back, right? My parents were traveling when they were pregnant with me. So it's exactly. kind of been my whole life. <laughs> exactly. So you were yeah. a little schooler growing up and then you took your kids out traveling. So this is a whole yeah. thing for your whole family. Yeah, I didn't go to third grade or eighth grade because we traveled um, those two years and that's what gave me the confidence. You know, those were the best two years of my child and my education personally. So I knew it was going to be great um, for our kids as well. We took off as a family in 2008 uh, and we thought we were just going to do one. Year. You know, we had this plan, like, like many people do, where you're just going to go do a year as a family. And we thought, great, let's ride our bicycles from London, England to North Africa and back, which we did. Oh, let's do um, that. Like, it's just such a cute yeah. <laughs> thing to do. Amazing. And the kids were five through 11 at that point. And wow. um, by the end of that trip, we were like, you know, we're having a really good time everyone's learning in the meantime we had begun to figure out how to work online which was really different in 2008 I mean the tools weren't there the companies were not really willing to let people do that we we had to push hard and, and really struggled with that for a while but once we figured out how to to work remotely and as everyone watching knows right like once you have that freedom uh you can be anywhere and the kids were having a great time everyone was learning and so we just you know, we kept going and we didn't, we didn't set out to travel forever, but we kind of did. So we traveled for about a decade, a little bit over full time with our kids. Not the whole um, time. And we're still, yeah, no, 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 definitely not all on bicycles. How long on bicycles? <laughs> How long were you on bicycles? Oh, one year on bicycles. And then we did some backpacking. We did camper vanning. We did, um, you know, in places for three to six months at a time we sort of as the kids grew and as our family evolved we did different things to meet their needs at different times you know there's not you and I've talked about this there's not one way to do there's not a right way to do it and the, I think one of the keys to it is just really paying attention to what your kids needs are and adapting right like that change is is part of what's important so yeah we, we did that for the kids entire childhood um they never went to school they were world schooled all the way till we went to university and when we took off, they were five, seven, nine, and 11. And they are now 20, 22, 24, and 26. <laughs> wow. Okay. So Hannah's your oldest and she's 26. She Amazing. Yep. Um, I know her a little bit. I don't know your younger kids as well. I mean, I've met them. Um, they're all amazing. But, um, I, and I want you to talk about them as adults now, but let's go back mm -hmm. in history to when they were kids and when you were first starting out. And, you know, based, uh, the typical question I ask is what motivated you? But I guess because you did it as a child, right? And you, your husband was yeah. okay with this and Tony um, was okay? No, no. It took me a full decade to wear my husband down. He was not into it. Like it, it wasn't that he was not into it. He really saw the value, but he was raised in a very traditional Midwestern American family and he didn't see how it was possible. Mm. So he loved the idea, but it, it took him a while. And when we took off, you know, he quit his job with Apple. Like people thought we were bonkers. Um, and he had agreed to one year because he could envision that. And it was through the process of travel that we grew also. And so it was, it's been really fun to watch our, our lives and our marriage and our family evolve as well through that. So yeah, um, it was basically because two years of my childhood had been so, so formational. And, you know, I, I hold a personal opinion that your, your education is not done if you haven't traveled, you know, and I don't, I don't care if you're, you know, if 
you're 60 or if you're 70 and you've never experienced anything other than your little neighborhood and bubble, there's more, there's more to learn. And honestly, our educations are never complete, right? Like there's always more to learn. Um, but to us, travel was a key component of that. And we wanted our kids to learn their place in the world in the context of the world. And that's what motivated us. That's amazing. Okay, you first started out in Europe and you kind of talked about the different modes of uh, traveling and where have you been in general? I mean, all the continents except for Antarctica <laughs> or? Yeah, uh, we've been to all the habitable continents. Absolutely. Okay. Some places we go back to more than others. Um, you know, my kids are all spread out and doing different things now, but still, you know, traveling some of them by times. Um, and we're like a nat right now. Uh, I'm in Guatemala. My husband is on a boat in the Bahamas. I like to say all that much. Like I don't want to live on a boat. So he's off doing that adventure by himself. Um, our daughter is in Ottawa. Gabriel, who's our next son, he goes by Fitz. He's in Charleston, South Carolina. He's a boat builder. Uh, the next one down is a chef and all, right now is working on a green energy project in New Brunswick, not chef related. And uh, our youngest is in commercial flight school. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, totally I mean, different things. Say, and like so being, you're in Canada, I, one is in the States. <laughs> yes. And I tell, I tell these um, newbies that are so nervous about pulling their kids out of school that they're going to mess them up that, you know, the vast majority, I think all the world schooling kids that I know that are grown are amazing and that they've figured things out and they're flourishing. So, um, and no thanks to, I mean, also thanks to you and to Tony. Um, so you decided to homeschool the whole time, not to unschool, not to put them into uh, local schools, correct? And there wasn't a lot of online you know, at that point. There's a war on, war in semantics around what to call all of these things. Okay. Um, I, there, were, the world, were, the word world schooling didn't exist. Uh, our basic to homeschooling our kids was child led and parent directed. So you know, we looked for what they were interested in. They had a huge say in what they learned. We did have some frameworks around what we hoped they would learn by the time they were sort of adults, but we didn't have a particular timeline on those things. They all progressed at different rates. Some of them were quote done with what is traditionally considered high school early. Others weren't. You know, I have a background in education. I didn't teach in the public schools on purpose. I didn't put my kids in public school on purpose. I think best educations are the ones that are, are tailor-made for each individual child. Uh, so I hesitate to say I am this or I am that because over the 20 year long haul of raising four kids, we were a little bit of everything at one point or another, because that's what each kid needed and no two kids learned the same way. So try not to get boxed in by the words and instead just be a student of your kid, you know, and do what they need. Okay. But tell us how you started. Like what, how did you homeschool at the beginning? And cause I'm sure things, um, you know, changed. Yeah. As they got oh older. massively like, absolutely because you didn't have we started uh, online apps really then right <laughs> no that's the other thing school? yeah no when when we started homeschooling you know our kids in like the late 90s right so it was a really really different landscape um that first trip when we were in Tunisia the big struggle was or when traveling through Europe and Tunisia the big struggle was finding books that were age appropriate in English. And we used to be scouring English language bookstops in like Prague or wherever, trying to, you know, trying to things because the Kindle wasn't the thing. There wasn't a thousand books in your pocket like there are now. There weren't YouTube videos on every single topic. So yeah, it's changed massively and technology for the win. Like how great is it now to be able to just dial up anything you want to know in your pocket? Um, so I like how we homeschooled, I think is actually completely irrelevant at this point because okay. We're doing it in what is now the dark ages. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, I know everything is. But yeah, it has changed a lot. Years. Pardon? Everything has changed so much in 10, 15 years. So it's changed um, so much in five years, Liz. Like, can you believe since we met oh, the resources yeah. that are available? It's fantastic. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so you didn't have any curriculum, you didn't use any apps, you just tried to find books. Yeah, no, we did, of course. Them. Yeah, there were books that we used for things. We used some organized math curriculum for various people points uh we did use apps you know when the language learning apps started coming out those were great we also put our kids in stuff like that you know we lived here in guatemala several times for three to six months at a time and our kids would go to spanish school while they were here we participated in homeschool groups everywhere like you know back before there was facebook connecting everyone all the time i would look for homeschool groups and pick a place and just join those local expatty groups of, of people who were doing things differently, which was a great way to connect and make friends and also learn forward. Um, 
we did a little bit of everything. The one thing we didn't do was any standardized testing of any kind. Like they never took tests, even the SAT and those kinds of things to get into college. You have to do those and you can still go to school. Any of your kids do like a community college as a teenager? Yeah, uh, when we were in Southeast Asia, Hannah was taking online classes through Oregon State University. I don't know how it is now, but at that time, they had a they made it very easy for kids who weren't old enough. You know, they had high school enrollment programs to allow them to take the actual university classes as kids remotely. Um, so, you know, we were in Borneo, and she's taking her intro to math and Spanish and these other things at the college level. It was great. Um, my younger two attended a local community college in uh, Ontario once we had a home base there and they and they did some some stuff that helped in ease their transition into university one of the best hacks i think is exactly that like when they're in high school let them take a few community college classes then they have a transit and it's just so much easier to to get them in to university without the testing and all of the usual rodeo because the the admission systems aren't set up for us um so well, learning to hack was important let's talk about um how hannah you enrolled her um because she was the first and you know she didn't yep. I don't know, you know, how much um, online stuff she was doing. So she was kind of a non-traditional applicant. Um, and, and, and before we talk about that, she had already started a business, a VA business, correct? Yeah. When she was about 16, she came to us and said, mom, I think I need to start a business. And I was like, okay, why? She goes, well, I'm going to move out in two years and go to college. I need to support myself. Great idea. <laughs> Awesome. And so she did. And that, you know, she worked on that business clear through college. And when she graduated, actually, she declined a job in her field because she wanted to go back to work in her business. Amazing. And she's done that. And so, you know, she's 26 now. She's in the process of getting ready to move to Europe to swing for EU citizenship and, you know, leveraging some of the digital nomad that are there. And she still uh, has her own, you know, she does her own thing. She ha awesome. didn't take the, any job in her career field. She studied it because she was interested, you know? Yeah. So let's, let's talk about this. She wanted to go to university and she, you yeah. applied in Canada only or the U S as well. We applied in Canada. Um, you know, and very practically university in Canada is much, much, much more affordable even for foreign people. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's great for us because we are Canadian and the kids are, but you know, other people should know that, you know, apply in other countries because you can get great educations as good as in the U.S. for, you know, a fraction of the price. Right. And she went to the number three school in Canada. It's a very good school um, with very competitive admissions. And yeah, I mean, she got in very easily and right away. But in fact, all of our kids did. So I, you know, you didn't I don't have transcripts, um, right? You didn't have a high school diploma. Yeah, well, one of the things people don't know is you can create that stuff for yourself, right? Like you can create a high diploma, you can create a transcript. There are lots of, of software services online that'll help you do that or tutorials to help you do that. It's not difficult. And one of the things that's super helpful in getting them in universities is to take this really nebulous, fantastic education they've had that doesn't fit into boxes and translate it into a format that people who've never thought outside the box, which are your admissions officers, <laughs> can, can read and understand. And so that, you know, that piece was helpful. Um, we also, you know, we have a portfolio because a portfolio assessment is just a much better way to assess what a kid knows. Um, and then, you know, instead of trying to apply through the forms online that are just not set up for people who do it differently, I always made a call to the admissions department and said, hey, I have this non-traditional student could we come in and just speak to a real human being about what the admissions process would look like for us? And I never told them that sort of my backdoor intention was I'm gonna apply this way. But if you can get in front of a real human being, you present, you know, I would take in a whole package of stuff, the diploma that we had made, the transcript that we had made, their portfolio, a list of all the books they had read in high school, all the things. And we just slide it across the table and say, this is our education. How, what do you recommend? This is the program that they wanna go into. And in every case, they laughed and were like, this is not going to be a problem. You've done so much more than, you know, we would expect somebody at this age to have done. Uh, so, you know, here, here's the backdoor entrance and, and it has worked every time. And I've helped lots of other people in that process. And I don't know anyone who has not gotten their kid in that way. So uh, think out, you've thought outside the box about their education, think outside the box about how you get them into the next step if that's what they want to do. Amazing. Amazing. I love that story. And so she, she studied uh, geography or what was her degree in? She studied geography. Yep. Uh -huh. And then and turned down a job and, when she graduated. Yep. Yep. Okay. She did. She yeah. And you know, her. my other son started, Fitz started his university work on a, 
on a sailing ship crossing the Med in the Atlantic. Uh, and then he ended up actually not going the university route all the way through because we discovered what he wanted to do there was not a degree path for it. And so, you know, on brand for a world school kid, he was like, mom, this isn't gonna work. This is not what I wanna do. What if I did this instead? And he'd laid out a plan for himself to get where he's going. Uh, and he's done it. He's great, no problem. And this um, is the Pope Builder. The other two, yeah, he's the Pope Builder. And then the other two, you know, Eli did go the, the traditional college university route. Um, and he also took classes at the community college and then transferred very seamlessly into his program. And the youngest one's in flight school, commercial flight school, which is different. Um, and, but the admissions process for that has gone really smoothly too. One of the cool things, like for the new people, and when you're worrying, because everyone worries about, oh my gosh, messing them up, like what's going to happen? Um, what you're doing provides so much more of a whole person, well-rounded education. Like, yes, you're going to tick the boxes. They're going to learn to read. They're going to learn to do the math they need to do. But all of the other stuff that isn't necessarily quantifiable on paper is so valuable at the university level, because what they're trying to do is build diverse communities of learners, but they're trying to do that with 10,000 cookie cutter applicants who've all done the very same things. Yep. So our kids are actually a currency, at some, especially at the better schools. Like if you're swinging high at some of the better schools, you will find that they are very eager to have your young people. So keep doing what you're doing and just document the heck out of it. Like write all the things down that are wild and crazy and fun that they do and learn and outside the box, because all of those things will be an asset for them later. That's amazing. Yeah, it's true. I mean, people, we're not going to ruin our kids' lives. We're actually going to give them a better education than the traditionally educated kids. Um, so you now consult um, people, you know, who with homeschooling. So what are some of yeah. the typical, um, I guess, newbie questions that maybe you could answer for us? Um, I mean, I think I'm trying to ask, ask you some of them, but um, yeah. and what age uh, kids do you help? I mean, I help families at all stages. It's not something, it's not my primary job. It's something that has that has emerged because you know there there are not there are not a whole lot of families out there still who are engaged in the world schooling community after their kids grow up who can you know provide a little bit of encouragement and support over the long haul of the process and that you know that's one of the things that I think is pretty valuable is that you know we did it from kindergarten to 12th grade and then university entrance and now they're all adults and and I'm super happy to just help and encourage people but there's not one way to do it. And my way to do it was only right for my kids. You know, you've got to do it your way. So I think the biggest thing that I help parents do is trust their intuition, trust what they know for their kids, figure out what that intuition is if they're struggling and they don't know, and then dial in exactly what an individual kid needs. Mm -hmm. um, and I love, I love playing that, with that and experimenting with families with that. Uh, in terms of questions, the big ones are always like, which curriculum should I use? Which is the wrong question to start with. <laughs> uh, or is this going to screw my kid up? Which I can't answer because that's not actually about education. That's about how you parent. And there are messed up families across the spectrum right. of ways of educating. And there are successful families across the spectrum of educating. So, you know, learning to, to parent in a way that supports the growth and development of a child and also meets the needs of every individual in the family. Like I do a bit of coaching around that kind of thing. Um, and then just, you know, general hand holding at stuck points, you know, what do you do when you've got a problem and you can't figure out how to get your kid through a particular stage or a roadblock? Um, I love to, to work with families and experiment with those kinds of things with kids. So um, what would a typical day look like or a typical week or a typical month look mm -hmm. like you guys when you were in the thick of things? Yeah, I mean, that varied, of course, as they grew, but in general, our pattern for life, because we both, we both worked also while we were traveling, when our mornings were for work time and for whatever kind of academic stuff they might be doing. So if they were doing an art class or they were drawing or they were reading or they were doing math or whatever, they had their stuff they were working on, we would all work together on that stuff in the morning. And then in the afternoons, we would often be you know, off on outdoor adventures, experience when where we were, that's when we would schedule like classes or homeschool groups or other stuff that we would go out and, and enjoy together. Um, we slowed down a lot as we traveled, like that first year on bicycles, we were moving fast. It's a lot harder to maintain any kind of patterns when you're moving forward all the time, all the time. And we also just got tired. Like if you only have a year, that's great, like go for it. But if you're in that for, you know, for the five or 10 or 20 year long haul, then right. I, most of the families I know learn to slow down a bit. And so, you know, our pattern is to be three to six months in a place as a base, which allows us to go deeper in what we're learning in the world in that area. And then we would move forward quickly for a month or six weeks. And then we'd be based again. 
And so our work and schooling routines would flex with that. You know, when we were moving forward a lot, it was a lot more unschooling. When we were stuck in a base, the kids would dig into projects and things they wanted to do that required us to kind of have some space to spread out and make a mess. Um, yeah, so being flexible. That was just us though. I, I mean, everyone should do as suits right. their family. Did you do any assessments or try to figure out like how they were improving? Was that difficult to do with your nomadic lifestyle? I mean, I have a teaching background, so I have a really thorough brainwashing and what the public school thinks you should do on that. And I pretty solidly disagree. Like when you only have one or two or three or four kids, you know what they're learning and you know if they're moving forward or if they're stalling out. And so, you know, we paid a lot of attention to where our kids were. We did a lot of sort of discussion oriented assessment, you know, around the dinner table, everyone's talking about what they're learning. That's a form of assessment. I, I'm not a fan at all of sitting little kids down and forcing them to perform or drag information out of them or test them. I, I think that kills the joy of learning for a lot of kids, not for all of them, but for a lot of them. And so I, you know, I encourage parents to like think more outside the box. If you're going to assess a skill, well, can they do the thing? If they can do it, great, check the box. They don't need to take a quiz for that. You know, right. um, if you, as long as you see them moving forward, I think it matters a great deal what pace they're moving at, you know? The idea of being ahead or behind is completely subjective. Right, right. Um, and so what the important thing say, is to keep an eye on development. What would you say if kids stop being motivated to learn certain things? Would you say you don't have to learn it or you found a, a Sometimes, well, I mean, not one answer to that. It depends on the kids. Um, sometimes kids need a break. Sometimes I need a break. Sometimes I stall out and I don't read a book for six months. And you know what? I'm still learning and it's okay. Um, also, you know, there's a concept in unschooling of strewing, which is this idea that you as a parent are watching your kids, you're watching for their interest and you're putting things in their path you might find interesting. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a caving trip or maybe that's, you know, uh, scuba diving lessons when they're nine or 10 that gets them sparks that idea of biology and marine biology. Maybe that's a particular book or a movie or an adventure. And so when I would see a kid sort of listless and like, I don't want to do anything, we would look for we would look for something that might spark that joy for them, spark that interest and just, you know, put in their path experiences and resources and people, you know, because people make the mistake of thinking that when you homeschool, you teach everything. That's ridiculous, right? You know, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And finding people that are going to inspire a particular kid to be like, oh, I want to be like them when I grow up. And then they will learn all the things from that person. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question fully, but that's how we did it. Well, again, I, you know, I, I, I've tried many different ways for, uh, for my kids to learn. One of them has ADHD and she at times will not be motivated, you know, and she changes her mind a lot. So that's just our mm -hmm. internal family struggle with her. Yeah. But, you know, just trying to get her back on track, I guess. And uh, I just hear this from a lot of parents that they're kids just aren't motivated. They're supposed to be doing their learning work, um, you know, whether they're homeschooling or even unschooling, though, the, the parents will uh, get frustrated. They're playing, you know, video games all day, watching videos all day. And, you know, sometimes these kids end up being computer programmers. So yeah, totally. And, and it's a fine balance as a parent. Like, how do you know when that's the hardest thing is how do you know when to push and when to back off? And I, you know, the answer is different for every kid. We all get it wrong and we also all get it right. Like over the long haul, one of the most useful pieces of parenting advice I got when my kids were little, this older mom said to me, look, it's not about what you do on any given day, but what you're characterized by over the lifetime of their childhood. And I was like, oh, amazing. Because that takes the pressure off of me to be the perfect mom all the time and have all the homeschooling stuff. It takes the pressure off of them as kids to be like, keeping up with the Joneses all the time. Right. Right. So, um, did you have them write in journals or, um, yeah. writing? Yeah. Or? That was one of the things I pushed actually, okay. because my parents pushed me on that when I was 13 and I complained bitterly and I still have that journal and I love it. Mm -hmm. And so we did have them journal, not every day, every day, every day, but often, um, because that was, it was one of the portfolio pieces, right? Like it's one of the things that demonstrates where they've been, what they've done, how they've learned and the evolution of their brains and their being over that period of time. So yeah, we did do a lot of journaling. Um, and I think that was one of the, the more fun things every now and then like one of the kids will find an old journal and they'll be like, mom, look what I found, which is super fun. Even though at the time I was dragging them through. <laughs> that is awesome. What other types of projects did you do while you were traveling? Um, 
any volunteers? Well, the, the year or? we were on bikes, they each chose a, a project to work on. Hannah collected dead people, oh. which sounds really hilarious, but she, um, she looked for historical characters everywhere. So like statues of people or plaques about people, or, you know, when you're in a place, who were the important figures in that place? She collected dead people. Yeah. Uh, Gabe at that point was photography. He was, he was nine. And so he took pictures of doors, interestingly, around Europe. He was really interested in the differences in doors and architecture and, you know, learning about tripartite symmetry from all of the cathedrals and stuff like that. Eli that year was um, collecting postcards. He would buy a postcard at least once a week and write it home to his grandmother, who then yeah. collected them all. And he said, we still have them, which is very cool. And Ez was only five. So he was the, he decided he was going to test Andy in every country. Andy. And so I know, but it was so much fun. And of course he had loads of help from the other kids because they thought this was a good project, <laughs> but they would taste all of these candies and they would, you know, collect the labels and write little reviews and talk about what they liked and they didn't like and notice the differences in, in, in that sort of thing around the world, which for a five-year-old was a hilariously great project. <laughs> that is an awesome project. Um, we've got a couple of people uh, commenting in the chat. I'm just gonna read some of them. Um, Kara great. said, I'm curious about college application process, but we talked about that and how- Yeah, how, and how people school. are happy to send me an email. I'm happy to help with that. Like I will send you information about what we do just because. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, maybe afterwards we can put your email or you can, um, I don't know if you're sure. in my group, but you can just, um, whatever. Um, let's see. So she said, organized math curriculum seems like a logical thing to follow rather than unschooling mindset for it. Um, so yeah, you, fo you followed some um, math curriculum and we use different, yeah. different things. And she said, great uh, college credits in high school help bypass tests like SAT. Correct. Yes, they do. Uh-huh. Um, pointing out universities want true diversity is excellent. Thank you. I loathe typical assessments. Such an inspiring talk. Awesome. Um, okay, so as your kids got older, um, how did things change? I mean, they got a little bit more involved with um, certain, they started having goals. I mean, uh, Hannah knew she wanted to go to university, right? So she was, were there certain, because I heard about this other uh, world schooling family and that daughter was studying 10 hours a day for five, six days a week before she applied. I mean, that sounds like pretty intense. Did you, did your kids do that? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. No, I, I mean, I, we, we never schooled more than five days a week. And even at the high school level, they never had more than half a day of work and often less than that. Your, your, um, of, of, of theirs, like. How many days a week were you doing? Never more than four days a week. Four, okay. And never more than about four hours a day. Okay. Like awesome. that was a mess. Okay. Yeah. Even as teenagers, they didn't do that. Especially as teenagers. When they were younger, it was less than, that. you know, it'd be maybe an hour or two of organized stuff. And, and even that hour or two, like that's not sitting at the table with your math books open. That would be 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, you know, lit, practicing some spelling words or times tables while bouncing on a trampoline you know, singing your geography songs while we're on a walk, like school doesn't have to look like school. That's the hardest thing for people to break out of their brains on. Exactly. Um, how did you figure, how did your kids or you figure out which universities to apply to? Um, well, we had chosen Canadian ones because we wanted them to spend some time living in Canada. And also it was much more affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, Queens is a great school. My mom gradu graduated from there with her second degree when, when, when I was in college. My brother went there. We knew it. It was, you know, we had a connection to it. Um, and then for my son, you know, he wanted to become a chef. So we applied to the school that had the very best chef program in Canada. Um, and it's one of only three like it in North America. So we just looked for the very best place for them to be. And we applied there first. They got in. So we didn't apply a bunch of other places. So what was that Probably like? Because was he, I mean, as a teenager cooking a lot and, and you know. Was, yeah, so how it changed as they got older, like one big thing that changed is that they went and did stuff, right? Like our kids from the time they were, I guess Hannah went on her own traveling the first time when she was 14. She went backpacking. We were living here in Guatemala and she took off with a couple of other teenagers and went down through Honduras and to Belize where they reconnected with us later. Um, Eli, the one who's the chef when he was 15. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. And when, um, he was 15. He actually flew down to Guatemala by himself for a month, uh, took the chicken buses up to where he was going to live. He'd organized his whole, his whole program to volunteer at a, 
a nutrition project for kids, which tracks with his chef goals. And then when he was 17 and took his gap year, which people think is hilarious, but even world schooling kids can benefit from a gap year. <laughs> uh, he went to the UK and took some chef certifications just to sort of see like, am I going to really want to do this for a career before he committed to the, the college path? Um, I think I mentioned when he was 17, he crossed the Med in the Atlantic on a sailboat, getting some college credit, but also pursuing his passion of, of sailing. And then the following year, my husband took all three of the teenage guys, Hannah was gone by himself to the Bahamas and back on our very small sailboat. So that was an adventure. Amazing. Fitz also worked on Windjammer, um, both Maine a couple of summers as a late teen. Uh, and as... I mean, as has been all over the map because he's just the one that has the least sort of framework for traditional living. But yeah, <laughs> he was in Europe. He was, you know, flying starting when he was about 15. Um, we really encourage them to pursue their passion, and try things, because how do you know where you want to go if you don't try stuff? Yeah. And we let them go do things. Like as teenagers, they are capable of a lot. Give them it's wings. Amazing. I think because they were traveling for so long, they had no fear, you know, because you, they were out there. Not the true. No, they absolutely have fear and they should because we all have fears and we should listen to those things. But we had talked a lot and built skills around, you know, your discomfort in a situation. We often track that as fear in our bodies does not actually mean that there is danger necessarily. What it, what it means is you're uncomfortable mm -hmm. and there's something that you don't know and that you need to learn. So we, and we had intentionally built their skills so that they knew what they needed. I said to somebody yesterday, like, yeah, I worried when my kids went to the mall because they didn't have a context for that and they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> but I didn't worry about them when they gear up at 17 to backpack for, you know, a month or two by themselves because that was their world. They knew that. Right. That's amazing. Yeah, right. It's about skill building, you know? Yes. Yeah, well, that's amazing. So Jennifer Jen is asking, what program did he get credits for sailing? Is there a uh, So we went through a program. It was a gap year program called CMS. Um, at that time, I was doing a bunch of work in gap year and was helping with the accreditation process of gap year uh, programs. And so I had a lot of sort of backdoor contacts there. Okay. Uh, but they Can you repeat it because your phone was kind of cutting out. C. Oh, I'm sorry. C. Mester. It's a gap year program um, that was a good fit for Fitz because it was an intro to all of the things that he thought he wanted for possibly for university next. So the university classes were your basic sort of communications classes, but also research like testing sal salination levels in various parts of the ocean and marine biology and advanced scuba and rescue diving and like all of those kinds of things were baked into that. Um, so sometimes an organized program that you, you know, that you enroll them in is the best way to test the waters for something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I think Jennifer, um, her daughter's really into marine biology and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Semester is great. I mean, of the of the ocean oriented gap year programs, uh, and I've I've known a lot of the people who who run several of them. Mm -hmm. um, I really recommend Semester. It's not particularly inexpensive, but it is. It's and we were really happy with it as parents, and I know it on the back end from the accreditation process, and like their risk management is in hand. It's a good program. Amazing. Um, were you guys um, socializing much while you were traveling? Because there, there weren't that many um, world schoolers at the time, but you mentioned you would meet them with homeschoolers. Yes. Yeah. Well, so there have actually always been world schoolers. Like I was world schooler, but there wasn't, there weren't groups for it. The internet has been amazing because it's connected everyone. Um, but there were, you know, there were little groups that were happening very early. There was a, a group called Families on the Move that had about, I don't know, 15 or 20 of us in it that we would meet up here and there. Um, and we had, you know, like two or three week kind of uh, like you are doing in Bansko, I guess, but it wasn't super organized at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I looked for homeschool groups and with four kids, I mean, one, one nice thing having several of course is that their socialization goes with them, right? Yeah. But they, we did it the same way it was done for me. We just kicked them out to play with other kids. We'd send them out to the beach with a soccer ball pretty soon they had 10 friends. Like it's, kids just know how to do that if you, if you provide them the time and the space and the resources. And are your kids still in touch with any of these other kids they met traveling? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's funny because yeah, when Ez turned um, turned 16, we had a birthday party for him on Wolf Island. And this girl that we knew from, from several of the family adventure summits and other things, she showed up at my house. Her family lives in BC. I was like, Chardonnay, man, do you are you here? She's like, oh yeah, I've been visiting my grandma in Ontario. She's only three hours away and has invited me to his party. So I just came over. I was like, great. 
<laughs> so awesome. I was texting Di, I'm like, yeah, your kid's at my house. He's like, yeah, I know. Like, okay. <laughs> so yes, they do. And, you know, they were good friends with, with several sets of kids. Talon Windwalker's uh, daughter, Haley, and Ezra were really good friends as little 10-year-olds, and they still talk. The Denning family, uh, we knew a lot of their kids, and Kaya and my big ones are still in contact. Um, yeah, staying in touch is not a problem now that we have phones in our pockets. Yes, that's great. <laughs> Um, my, one of my 13 year olds wants to be a digital nomad and Hannah is good. One. So what is her lifestyle like? Hannah's? Yeah. I oh, mean, well, I mean, right now she lives in Ottawa. You, you should interview tell. her, Liz, because I want to, I want to do stories. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I'm hoping later on to have a panel of grown, uh, world schoolers. And I'm, I want to ask her. That would be a blast. That those those kids are amazing. My favorite part of Family Adventures of it was always the teen panel yes. because somebody would throw us under the bus and it was hysterical every time. Yeah. No, it was very inspiring. That's why I kept going. Yeah, the kids are great. They really are a lot of fun. Um, so I mean, you should ask Hannah that question. She hasn't lived with me since she was 18. So okay. I'm ready to sort of speak for her and her lifestyle, but she lives in Ottawa right now. She's staging to move to Europe. Um, Pre-pandemic, she was she spent a little over a year traveling. She flew in from Turkey the day before they closed the border to Canada, and that's what based her back in Canada was was the pandemic. And so she's just now, you know, getting to uh, to something she wants to do. But she's um, she's swinging for the digital nomad visas. She wants to get EU passport if she can. Um, I think right now her plan is to, to base herself either in Spain, Portugal, or Hungary. I think Hungary is the, the top contender right now, oh. but, um, but yeah, like she works online and she, uh, does some teaching and consulting for, for world school kids, teaches classes in a bunch of different stuff and, um, does it her own way, which is great. Like, I don't have any expectations of what my kids do as adults, other than that they do the thing that inspires them and that they are happy in their lifestyle. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, you guys must have gotten really close traveling together for all those years. Yeah, we did. And that, you know, that was one of the best things, Liz. Like, yes, you can get them into college. Yes, they're gonna be very successful because they have a super diverse set of skills. But like at the end of the day, when you think about your parenting, like what does everybody want? You wanna be good friends with your kids when they're an adult, right? Like you wanna be close. You want them to have good relationships with their siblings and not feel estranged for them. You, you, you want to avoid the brokenness that we see in so many kids and families. And living intensely together is hard because it makes you as a parent deal with your own shit in a way. You know, you can't blame it on the school or blame it on the teacher. It's like, yep, okay, we jacked that one up or on our own. <laughs> and then you're responsible to sort of fix it, you know? But, um, but the, you know, at the end of the day, and there were seasons that were a mess. Oh my gosh, that we're like, this is not well. But now that they're all in their 20s, like we have a family chat that they're, they play in every single day together. I mean, we talk to them every day and they talk to each other and they support each other. And like that relationship piece, that's what I wanted out of parenting and out of, out of this world schooling adventure. It wasn't about having the smartest or most successful kid. I could care a lot about that. But the relationship piece, that's such a gift. Totally, totally. What, um, what challenges did you have? Cause it wasn't always perfect and rainbows and butterflies. Um, with the, what no. were the downsides of this lifestyle? I mean, with four kids, it's not possible to make everybody happy all the time. Right. So there were seasons where one kid wasn't loving it and another kid was loving it. And you know, what was great about that was we spent a lot of time sort of teaching negotiation and talking about, okay, well, how do we get most people's needs met to the time? And, and when do we in the community give up the thing that we might really because our sister or brother really wants to do this thing and we can't do it all you know or you know Ezra one time said mom uh can we go to Paris for my birthday I'm like no my dude it's on the wrong side of the planet right now and we're not spending ten thousand dollars to fly everyone over there but we will get there eventually so sharing with them sort of what are the constraints in which we live as a family budgetary uh relationship wise extended family wise um, our values around travel and, and how we spend our money and, and who we are impacts on the planet. Like all of those kinds of conversations were cons exercises in negotiation and learning to live and thrive together. And we didn't always get it right. Like I, we left no stone unturned on the things to screw up as parents. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you just got to do your best. And over the long haul, our best is usually good enough. That's good. Well, it's turned out so, so far, knock on wood. Um, how are you guys supporting yourself during your travels? Um, Tony works in technology, yes? 
yeah, he does database development, de development and design for big companies like Johnson & Johnson and Ocean Spray. He built apps for a while. Um, we've done a lot of little things. I started by travel writing because in 2008, you know, it was the explosion of blogging and lo and behold, people wanted to read about families doing ridiculous things with too many kids. So <laughs> I got some travel writing early and then I morphed into two editing for travel publications. And then I was in marketing for a little while. Um, all the while doing education stuff on the side and with families. Uh, and we, you know, we've all worked remotely and we've, you know, we've always tried to choose our roles in alignment with our values and in alignment with what we wanted out of our lifestyle. And would your budget kind of vary depending on where you were and if you were bicycling or, or sailing? Or yeah, I'm, it changes obviously. Um, but you know, we have a, I mean, most people probably know this that are in your group, but traveling is actually now more expensive than having a home base somewhere, right? So the only year that we kept track of every penny, which is because we were interested, was the first year we were out. And that first year of cycling, including everything, airfare, hotels that we stayed in, camping, food, museums, every single thing we did for that year, we spent about $5,000 for six people in Europe. And the number the, again, because you're breaking up a little. I'm sorry, about $35,000 okay. that year. Yeah. Our budget the year before living in the United States had been 70,000. Of course, yeah. So, you know, often it's about choose making choices around not what you do but how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are almost always ways to make a thing happen if you're creative. And again, technology has just changed the game because isn't Airbnb a blessing? <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, if you get a good one, I've had a couple of bad ones. Oh, well, um, yes, everybody's had a couple, but you know, the idea that you can live anywhere affordably within your budget and you can yes. see those places advance and like, it's all of those things are just so much easier than they were 15 years ago. Exactly. Um, okay. I just want to see if anyone has any questions. I know you're, you know, you were nice enough to zoom, or zoom in on your phone. So we don't want to use up too much of your data. Um, That's okay. Can you come back to this video later and put any of your social media, if you have Instagram or whatever you sure. have, your former travel blog, whatever you want to showcase, okay. um, please come in and put it there. And then also, you know, if you have a web link for your um, homeschool, world school consulting. I don't. I just do that quite casually. If people are stuck, reach out. I'll tell you, you know, if I can't help you, I will know somebody who can. You know, that's the other fun thing. I've got a big network of people who are great at specific things. And I'm so happy to connect people because I remember what it was like to be struggling and freaking out and just be like someone to help. So I love to connect people with others. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer Miller. And I hope to see you again in real life one of these days. Yes, me too. Oh, are we will. Yeah. And um, uh, how is everything in uh, your Nicaragua or Guatemala? I'm in Guatemala. Um, everything's good. I'm actually just about to take a friend of mine all the way on the lake today. I'm on Lake Atitlan. Uh, I live in a town called Sununa there uh, a lot of the time. So we're off on also, an adventure this afternoon. You're also trying to help the local weavers sell their cloth. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I work uh, with, I support a family here that are master weavers. Um, yeah. If people want to look at my personal Facebook, there's a bunch of things actually right now that are for sale that I would carry out of the country for you and, and mail to you. But they are uh, a group of women who, who are amazing and um, we sell their fair trade prices and in case anyone's wondering I take zero dollars for that in fact I lose money on it because I end up paying the shipping to people all over the world so that's not about me it's about them <laughs> that is so wonderful for you to help um yeah Jennifer Jenna saying thanks so much this was super inspiring and helpful Katie says thank you have an amazing day and yeah eye-opening so thanks Jennifer and um yeah hopefully we will uh, see you in real life soon I really wish the family adventure summit was still happening and oh I know me too back. You know what? I don't know. I should reach out and see if the other organizers are interested now that the pandemic has, you know, blown over to the extent where we can move around a bit and the yeah, we, and we canceled it because trying people from everywhere into certain countries was just but you know, too much. You were doing it every year, maybe once every three years or once every five years. Yeah. Yeah, I should reach back out to the organizers and see, you know, it, it was kind of a team of four or five of us that put that together at, at the time, sort of half as a family reunion for those of us that live this way and have for a long time and have, come on, you can do this for new people. And it was, it was a really fun mix of, of inspiring folks. I, I loved love it. it. You know what, I'm here in Bonsco and somebody showed me a picture from the Family Adventure Summit from San Miguel de Allende. What was that? Five years ago. And yeah. there was a picture of me on a panel with your husband and Astrid and a couple oh, other people. He's like, yeah, five years ago. And here we are again. So it was hilarious. Yeah. 
and you know what? All of that, like all the Family Adventure Summit stuff, that grew out of one little meetup that we had with six families in in Penang, Malaysia in like 2010. Wow. And that little group of families, we were so close knit, just decided to give back, right? Like mm-hmm. we lost money every year on that. But um, yeah, like d- never underestimate the power of, of what you're doing in Bonsco right now, because years yeah. on, you guys will be like shining the light for the next people. Well, I mean, I'm you just, already are, Liz. I'm just, a customer right now. I'm just a customer here. I'm friends with the organizer here and I promote it because I love it here. Um, but uh, you had about 400 people um, over the yeah. four, three, four, five day summit. I forget. Yeah. The one in Bali was our biggest one. Um, yeah. It, there would be, there was, it was quite a group and, you know, with full programming for little kids and teenagers and adults. And it was a blast. That was what, it was one of the most fun things we got to do. Well, awesome. Well, listen, I don't want to ever um, have a brick and mortar business and do a summit, but if you want me to help you, I will. Okay. Just okay. a small member of the team. I'd be, I'd be willing to do that, but I just don't want to be the main organizer. So you know what? I totally get that because it yeah. took a ton of work. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Liz. It's been so fun to talk to you. Have a great day. It's so good Thanks. to see you. You too. Thanks for watching. This is Liz Quain with Trailblazing Families. My twins and I have been traveling and world schooling for over six years, and I'm happy to share about our experiences. Make sure to check out the other videos on this channel. I do have a playlist of all the other interviews of other world schooling families and service providers. Uh, We're all happy to share um, our information and wisdom about how to best live this world schooling digital nomad and family travel lifestyle. If you're new to world schooling and need a bit of help, I do have a super comprehensive 12 week program on how to travel extensively as a family and how to world school, how to educate your kids. There's many different ways to do it. So reach out to me and schedule a no obligation Zoom meeting so we can have a quick chat and see if my program is a good fit for you. Thanks and happy trails.